Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study today. We thank you because of the faithfulness of your people. We thank you because of the joy we have in congregating together around the table of the Lord to eat, to benefit, to take in the word of God and to be shown the path of righteousness by your word. Oh Lord, I thank you for these people who are faithfully coming every Monday, every week like this to listen to what the Lord has to say. Oh Lord, I pray that as we come, coordinators, leaders, zona leaders, workers, members, people that are hungry for the truth and for righteousness. I pray, O oh Lord, your blessings will enrich every life in Jesus' name. I know that it is through this word you are developing people, you are training people, you are equipping people, you are preparing us for a greater ministry. You are equipping us for a greater relationship. And I pray, O oh Lord, that your purpose in giving us this word will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. I'm asking, O oh Lord, that you will grant us not only the assistance of our brain to be able to understand, because the natural mind cannot comprehend, cannot fully understand the things of God. I pray that you will give us, O oh Lord, the Spirit of God that will explain, that will apply, that will uh, drill the word of God deep into every heart, and we will really understand. And you will write these words upon the fleshly tables of every heart in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that this word will make us strong. This word will enrich us. This word will really feed us. This word will really give us confidence. And we will live victoriously because of the word you are teaching us in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we have dedicated ourselves to hearing your word, learning your word, that nothing whatever will hinder our benefit from the word in Jesus' name. We come now, Lord, before the open Bible with an open heart. Wanting to receive from you, saying, Speak, Lord, for your children are hearing. And we pray that the word will definitely benefit us and will be the kind of people we ought to be for the glory of your name. Teach us your way, O Lord. Help us to understand and to follow through. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study today, and we thank God because He has kept us faithful until this time. Coming week after week, listening to the Word of God, wanting to get the benefit out of the Word of God. Actually, today we are beginning a new series of studies, and it's uh, the epistle to the Hebrews that we are beginning today. This epistle actually is very, very important. And I will just uh, remind you that as you have been faithful in coming before, be faithful that way and keep on coming. Because this study will actually enrich your life. As we talk about uh, coming for Bible study, I need to remind you that Bible study is the backbone of the believer. You see, the believer will be weak. The believer will be uncertain. The believer will be unsure about a lot of things if he does not have regular study of the Word of God. In fact, it is this Word that gives us assurance. It's the Word that gives us certainty of things to come. It is the Word that deepens our anchor and our faith. It is this Word that increases our faith in the Lord. Because faith comes by the Word and the, comes by the hearing of the Word of God. It comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It is this uh, Word that will even give us a brighter vision. The vision of what we need to do for the Lord. The vision of what the Lord needs to accomplish in our lives. And the vision of eternity. It is this word that will really quicken us and deepen that vision. It is this word that will feed us. When we are discouraged, our encouragement is in the world. It is in the world we have joy. It's in the world we have life. In fact, it says the world is even health or medicine to all our flesh. It is this word that will make the simple or the foolish to be very wise. It is this word that will train us and prepare us and equip us for helping other people. 
you cannot do without the real study of the word of God. I must remind you, although I think you know this, that there is difference between preaching and teaching. You know, in preaching, a person can just take a, you know, a verse of scripture, give illustrations, and then preach out of it, encourage us, and motivate us, and move us on, and we go on with enthusiasm, and fire, and zeal. But you know, teaching, teaching is the one that is laying block after block, bringing point after point, making everything to be so settled within us, it is the teaching that answers our question. It is a teaching that resolves our doubts. It is a teaching that consolidates the things we have known. It is a teaching that makes us to fully understand to the point that we will not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It is a teaching that makes us so solid upon the foundation that we are able to stand firm and even be able to teach others also. And as you come every Monday like this, it will be teaching. We're going to go from one part of the Bible to another part of the Bible, align the Bible to make explanation and to comment upon other verses of the Bible. We'll look at important words, we'll look at important phrases, we'll look at the expressions, we'll look at the various things that we have in the world we're studying so that we can have a real full study. And I please want to remind you that uh, in our church in Deeper Life, um, Bible study had been the real foundation and the backbone of everything that we're doing. So I hope nobody will sleep, nobody will be dozing, nobody will say too many verses of scripture. We're going from this place, we're going to that place. Let us uh, sit down and let us brace up ourselves. We are ready for the study of the word of God. I told you that we're going to study the epistle to the Hebrews. And we're starting today from chapter 1. Actually, in this introductory study, we will not study too many verses. We'll move faster later. But as at now, I want to read with you and open your Bible with me to verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're not studying the whole, all those four verses, but the reason I put all the four verses together, you will notice that it's a long sentence. Because at the end of verse 1, there is a comma. At the end of verse 2, there is a semicolon. At the end of verse 3, there is no full stop yet. You have the full stop until you come to verse 4. That's why I'm bringing everything together in our reading. So you can get the total, the flow of it. Now Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past, Unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days, spoken unto us by his son, that son whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he has made the world, who so being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself put our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, and as and he as by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. With those wonderful words and deep words indeed, were introduced to this marvelous epistle. This epistle to the Hebrews has many deep uh, truths that demand diligent study and faithful study. And I believe that as you are starting today, you will never miss any study because actually every study is so necessary for your complete understanding of the revelation that God has given to man. These uh, verses that I've read to you now, they form or they provide a fitting introduction to the whole epistle. Actually, you will see that in verse 2, we have the mention of the Son of God, as in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Then in, the, in that same verse and in verse 3, He begins to tell us something about the Son. Look at what He says, we'll saw it deeply later, He has appointed Him to be heir, inheritor of all things. It is by this Son that He has made the worlds. It is this Son that is the brightness of His glory. In fact, it is this Son that is the express image of His person. It is this Son of God that upholds all things. Think about it. 
the whole universe, everything you have in the universe, it is the Son, it is Christ that upholds all things by the word of his power. And what has he done? He has himself purged our sins. What is he doing now? He is sitting at the right hand of majesty on high. What do we know of him? He became much higher, much better than the angels. And by inheritance he has obtained a more excellent name than they. Those verses tell you that the concentration and the focus of the epistle to the Hebrews is actually Jesus Christ. That's right. Because you see, the overall theme of this epistle is the superiority and the preeminence of Christ. And we are told that he is greater and is better than anyone and anything that was before. Is better than any Old Testament person, any Old Testament institution, any Old Testament ritual, any Old Testament sacrifice. In fact, is better than, uh, greater than anything else in the Old Testament or the, in the New Testament. Is even better than anything in the whole universe put together. Is superior to angels. Is superior to Moses. Is superior to Joshua. Is superior to Aaron and his priesthood. His covenant is superior to the Old Covenant. The sacrifice of Christ is superior to the Old Testament sacrifices and his testimony is superior to that of any other. A gifted writer has put it this way. Thinking about Christ and reading about Christ and seeing what the life of Christ has really accomplished and what he gives to us, this is what this gifted writer has said. He said, I'm reading from the outline actually, Jesus Christ came from the bosom of the Father to the bosom of the Virgin. He put on humanity that we might put on divinity. He became the son of man that we might become the sons of God. He was born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty. He was reared in obscurity. And only once crossed the boundary of the land in which he was born and that in his childhood. He had no wealth, he had no influence, and had neither training nor education in the schools of the world. His relatives were inconspicuous and uninfluential, in, yet in infancy he startled the king. In boyhood he, po he puzzled the learned doctors. In manhood he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet all the libraries of the world could not hold, could not contain the books about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme of more songs than all the songwriters put together. He never founded a college, yet all the schools together cannot boast of as many students as he has. He never practiced medicine, yet he has healed more sick bodies and broken hearts than all the doctors of the world. Throughout history, great men have come and gone, yet this Christ we are talking about lives on. Herod could not kill him, Satan could not seduce him, death could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. And we'll be learning more about this marvelous, majestic Christ in this epistle as we get into this epistle. Think about it, that this supreme one, this one that is better than everything, everyone's before and after, better than, greater than anything in the whole universe, that's the one we're studying about. In fact, may I give you an assignment? Read the epistle to the Hebrews yourself. From chapter 1 right through to the very end. And read it many, many times. You'll find the word coming up over and over and over again. It's the word better. You'll find as you read through a better hope. A better testament. A better promise. A better sacrifice. A better substance. A better country. A better resurrection. And you'll find that Jesus Christ is presented as a supreme best. There's another word you'll come across as you read through the epistle. You read of the heavenly Christ. The word heavenly. Heavenly Christ, the heavenly calling, the heavenly gift. If you have the heavenly country, you will think of, you'll see the heavenly Jerusalem, and you'll discover our names are being written in heaven. As you come to this epistle, everything is presented as better, as new, as heavenly. And we are told that there is a better covenant and Christ is the mediator of that better covenant. 
And as you come to this study, you really need to come with an open mind, with an open heart, so that you will receive so much from the things were given in this epistle. I confess to you that as I read through myself and as I study and as I prepare outlines, I see that there is so much in this. And you know I need to tell you that I've been a Christian now for so many years by the grace of God. And yet there is such a richness and such a depth in this epistle that as I read the you know Bible verses and read the commentaries and study the various things, uh, the materials that are available in this epistle, I just ask myself, why didn't I know this all along? Why didn't I see this all along? There is much for us to discover in this epistle as we come. There is no doubt in my mind that these times we're having together, these Mondays, will be the time of training, the time of development, the time of education, the time of equipping, the time of uh, really getting into the world and eating from this bread of life. You cannot come to studies like this and not be enriched in your Christian life. You'll get nearer to God. You will enjoy real fellowship with the Lord. And you will know that you have really been in the presence of the Lord as you study. Now we're going to take today verses 1 and the first part of 2. Verses 1 and the first part of 2. Let me read to you again. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us, by his son. I want you to stop there for a moment. You see those uh, simple verses I've read to you. Covers a lot of ground. It's talked of times and manners and the last days. It's actually covered dispensations. Periods of time. Ages. Centuries. He said at sundry times. Which means in different, uh, in different periods of time. In different manners, diverse manners, methods and modes. He spoke in time past unto the fathers. He's talking of the time of the patriarchs. He's talking of the time of the kings. He's talking of the times of the judges. He's talking of the times of the prophets. He's talking of the times of the minor and the major prophets. Until it came to the end of the Old Testament. He spake unto the fathers. By who? By the prophets. He's talking of the source of revelation, of the channel of revelation, of the target of revelation. He's talking of the source as God. He's talking of the channel as the prophets. He's talking of the target, the people that receive the revelation as the fathers. But then he tells us that in these last days, in these last dispensation, he is now speaking unto us. He's speaking unto us by his son is talking of the last dispensation that is from the time of the new testament the new covenant until the time in which we live now is one long stretch of dispensation and in these last in these last days which is the last dispensation is speaking unto us actually there's something wonderful here is making us who are living now in this 20th century of the same period of time with the people that lived in the first century and is saying unto us it says there's no difference that Peter and James and John and Paul and all these others in the first century they lived in the same dispensation we are still living in now and we have the same privilege and the Lord the Son Jesus Christ is still speaking unto us and God is still the source of revelation now the Son is the channel and we are the target receiving the word through them now that is just to tell you that the scripture the Old Testament and the New Testament has been given as coming from God, but coming through different channels. By the prophets in the Old, by the Son in the New, and everything has now come to us, but it came from God. For the study today, we're going to have two points, and these points are very important. You don't want to miss anything. You have your biro in your hand or your pencil in your hand. You are going to be marking a lot of verses. You are also going to be underlining some points on your outline. Two points we are talking about. Number one, revelation and inspiration of scripture. 
revelation and inspiration of scripture number two complete and final revelation through christ complete complete and final revelation through christ now number one this is so important the revelation and inspiration of scripture look at hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 again god who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets stop there for a moment now if i pick the important words here follow me i'm going to meet some parts of the sentence just to make it clear to you and i'm going to pick on important words number one god to speak number three unto the fathers number four by the prophets put all that together god speak unto the fathers by the prophets well it tells you something very important that actually all that you have in the old covenant all that you have in the old testament all that you have coming to the fathers coming to the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings and the judges and the people of the old testament came from god through the prophets god spake unto the fathers by the prophets but then the question you are asking is how did he speak did he give the whole of the old covenant all in one section in one blog and just with one voice at one point in time gave everything it says no he did it at sundry times what does that mean he did it some at the time of um, abraham some at the time of noah some he gave at the time of uh, joseph some he gave at the time of moses at the time of uh, aaron at the time of joshua at the time of david at the time of the samuel at the time of the prophets until you come to the time of malachi which tells us that they came a piece at a time they came at different times, but then it came a piece at a time. Which means then, we have the full acknowledgement that what we have in the Old Covenant, that is in Scripture, what we have there is the revelation coming from God. It came at sundry times in different parts, in many parts. It came in different manners too, in diverse manners. This telling us another thing. Pay attention. This is very important. That the revelation of scripture did not come in one form of language. Anybody who studies literature will tell you that there are many forms of literature. And if you are going to understand literature, you have to know what form is it. Because even apart from being, you know, even if you are not a lecturer, you are not a teacher of English or literature, you will know this, that you don't interpret a parable like you interpret a prophecy. You do not interpret an illustration which is just an example giving a story told with a, like an illustration, like you interpret real history. Because history and story, that is an illustration, will be different. And therefore the interpretation will be different. And so, with this understanding and knowledge that God gave the revelation in diverse manners, then we know that he employed different methods to communicate his word and his will unto us. At one time it was by history. At another time it was by prophecy. At another time, it was by Proverbs. At another time, he gave us the revelation and communicated the revelation to us in solemn, special messages. Sometimes it came by direct communication. Sometimes by dreams. Another time by visions. You see, these series of revelations came over a period of time. Would you know that if you were to think of the time between Adam, the first man, and Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, you are thinking of a period of more than 3,500 years. And then you have the intertestament period, a period of about 400 years. You put everything together before the New Testament, the world had been for at least about 4,000 years. And God during that period had not been silent. He had been speaking from the very first day of creation. And until the time of Malachi, he kept on speaking, kept on speaking, kept on speaking. But uh, I need to tell you this, you know, when our children go to school, how do we teach them? When they get to the kindergarten, you teach them in concrete, concrete terms. 
when it comes to primary section, you begin to drop the concrete things little by little. They no more are counting the fingers. They no more are counting the stones. You are now going to some things that are practical but not so concrete. When it comes to secondary school, you are now teaching them directly. You, you park aside all the stones. You park aside all the sticks they have been counting. You just write on the board with the figures. When you come to the university, you are not even talking of symbols and principles and axioms. It's the same thing God has done. That in the earlier days, he will speak with concrete, concrete terms. But then in later days, as uh, things became, all the sacrifices were then being faded off and Jesus eventually came. We do not need all, all the sacrifices anymore. Incense we don't need anymore. The tabernacle we don't need anymore. And all these various things and the things of the old covenant we don't need anymore at sundry times. In diverse manners, God revealed his mind little by little. A peace here, a peace here, a peace here. That is a peace at a time. And you find that that is how God revealed his word. And that affects us in the interpretation. Because you see, as we now interpret, we understand what that's a We say that's a proverb. We say that is a prophecy. We say that is history. We say that's a commandment. We say that's a warning. And our interpretation depends on the mode of revelation. Let me give you this example. If, for example, you are reading and uh, you read of the tree, that is, uh, you know, the tree that everybody knows. If that word appears in an illustration, then there is an understanding of it. If it appears in a parable, then there is an interpretation to it. If it appears in a prophecy, there will be an interpretation to it. If it appears in a commandment, there will be an interpretation to it. If it appears in a meta metaphorical sense, which means when it says, uh, by their fruits you shall know them, a tree is known by its fruits. You really know that it's talking about the Christian, about the human being, and it's talking about the character of the person. So you see that because these things are revealed at sundry times in diverse manners, it affects your mode of interpretation. Well, as uh, we look at this, uh, that God revealed all these things in, in various ways. Is it only Hebrews that talks about that? Other parts of the Bible talk about that too. I told you earlier in this study, we're going to be comparing scripture with scripture. We're going to be allowing scripture to interpret scripture. That's the best way of interpretation. So that your faith will not rest in the wisdom of man, but your faith will rest in the foundation of Scripture, as well as Scripture to comment upon itself. Now come to Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. Hosea chapter 12 verse 10. I have also spoken by the prophets. How did he speak by the prophets? Listen to this. I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. At different times, remember, in diverse manners. He said, I have used, I have multiplied visions, I have used similitudes, I have used symbols. Then we are also told in Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we are following through on scripture, the ministry of the prophets have brought the word unto us. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this false, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. You hear that? The prophecy, the scripture, the word were given came not in old time. Remember the old time? It is talking about in, at sundry times, in different, at different times. It came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Remember? The source of that revelation is God himself. The channel through which the revelation came, the prophets, the holy men of God that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost in Luke chapter 1 verse 17. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. 
has something in your mind as you are opening to that. The revelation has the source, the origin as God. The channel as the prophet. And then we are the people that receive the words. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Who spoke? God spoke. It's not the word of Moses or the word of Joshua or the word of David or the word of Samuel. It's not the word of Jeremiah or of Isaiah. It is the word of God. You see, there are people that will tell you that after all, those uh, Jewish people, they collected uh, their wise men together and they put together some uh, things concerning religion. And he said, which you could do the same, we could call our people together, and Nigerians too can produce a Nigerian book of religion. And the Africans too can produce an African book of religion. The Asians too can produce uh, their Asian book of religion. And uh, it will be of the same value and quality with the Bible because it is a Jewish book of religion. No, not at all. No, not at all. God used those prophets. He used those men. But God is the source of the revelation. God is the source of the scripture. It says in that verse 70, it says, As he spake, as God spoke, by the mouth of his holy prophets, which had been, had been since the world began. In um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. We're looking at the latter part of verse 21 there. Acts chapter 3, the latter part of verse 21. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Again, he's telling you that the origin of the revelation, the origin of scripture is God. God has spoken. But then how did he speak? He gave us the channel by which he spoke. By all is the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I'm telling you this so that you'll have, you'll have no doubt in your mind. That the Bible you hold in your hand, this is the word of God. This is the thing that tells us that the scripture is inspired of God. In fact, it says, uh, you know, from what we have read now, that the Old Testament, although it may have come by revelation, by vision, by prophecy, by parable, by type, by symbol, or by commandment, one thing we know, God spoke. Yes, Moses was involved, but God spoke. Joshua was involved, but God spoke. Oh yes, he used Samuel as one of his prophets, but God spoke. Have that in your mind whenever you read your Bible, that this is God speaking to man. The Old Testament is not a collection of the wisdom of ancient men, but it is a voice of God. Men were used to write the Old Testament, but they were totally controlled by the Spirit of God. Every word they wrote was by the word that God decided they should write. Every word they wrote was the word God decided they should write. How are we sure that we have the very mind of God, the will of God, the word of God in the Bible we hold in our hand? How do we know that the totality of it, the completeness of it, is the word of God? God spoke. But now listen. You say, but sometimes I read and I don't understand. Praise God for that. It shows that God is greater than man. It, show, it shows that the knowledge of God is deeper than the understanding of man. It shows that God is higher than the highest mountain. That is the reason you read part of it and you need His help. You need the Holy Spirit to be able to interpret unto you. To be able to make you to understand. Because this is the word of God. And then you say, hey, there's something I wonder about this Bible. Every time I read this Bible, it appears fresh to me all the time. That's the evidence it is coming from God. Because you know, because God is the ever present I am that I am. When the people of old, when they read it, it was fresh. When the people of today, when they read, it is fresh. Because it is the ever-present I am that I am, that has spoken it, and that has given it unto us. You say sometimes, it's something that makes me to wonder is that, you know, 
The Bible is so versatile, which means that an old person will read it and find comfort. A young person will read it and find strength. A troubled person will read it and find comfort. A, and a troubled person, another person will read it and find help. A sick person will find, read it and find encouragement. A troubled person or a sad person will read it and find a relief. You say, what I don't understand about this Bible is that it gives solution to every problem of every man, whatever their situation, whatever their circumstance. That telling you is it is the word of God. Because it is God that is able to speak to all men in the same book and solve all their problems. But then, the, to go back to the thing I said first, that you know sometimes you read it and you cannot understand. The reason is because you need a relationship with the Lord. So that you will be able to understand the revelation of God. Let me put it this way. Relationship with God clears up the revelation from God. Relationship with God clears up the revelation from God. You need to write that down. It is as you get born again. How do you get born again? You realize that you are a sinner. You realize that all your good works, all your giving money to the beggars, anything that you have done of yourself, all that cannot save you. And you want to understand the Bible. You want to receive comfort from the Bible. You want to receive strength from the Bible. And you cannot really understand because you read it and everything is like a strange thing to you because it is like the word of a stranger to you. You don't have relationship with God. You realize you are a sinner. You confess your sins to the Lord. And then you say, oh God, please cleanse me. Please forgive me. Please change my life. I want everything to change in my life. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. That very moment your sins are forgiven. That very moment your life is changed. That very moment you come into relationship with God. Because it says, if we believe in Him, that faith in Christ makes us to become sons of God. And when you, that happens, you now have a relationship with Him. Now you can say, Abba, Father. Because it's not your father, it's like you are reading the words of your father. Relationship now with God clears up for you the revelation that you are getting from God. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now I need to clear something uh, that is uh, very uh, necessary. That is uh, uh, the prophets. Who are the prophets? What's the ministry of the prophets? How can we describe the prophets? I will confess to you that uh, earlier before I became a born again Christian, I thought of prophets are the people that were wearing long robes. Maybe white, maybe blue, maybe purple, maybe red, maybe another color. And they were holding a stick in their hand, and they were carrying a bell in their hand, and they were burning candle, and they were burning incense, and they were prophesying to people, saying that uh, you will uh, marry a light in complexion lady, or you will go to work in a factory, or you will go to university, or it will rain tomorrow. I thought those were the prophets. And then I became born again. And when I became born again, one of the first problems I had is that I thought that this uh, church, evangelical church, uh, preaching that we should be born again, I said there is no prophet there. Because I didn't see anybody wearing the long robe, I didn't see them with the bed in their hand, I didn't see them with their stick, I didn't see them with the candle. I said, well, the thing here is good, but it looks like uh, there is no prophet. It took some years before I studied in the Bible. And I began to discover that I had erroneous ideas of who a prophet was. You know, those days, if I wanted to see a prophet before I was born again, I either go to the riverside or go to the backyard of a place where they are ringing bells or where they are running around the place or where they have a cross somewhere, you are kneeling down. You are buying down, they are trying to interpret dreams for you. I thought that was the prophet. But then look at it, it says, God, who at sundry times spake uh, to, and in diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. I now want to know from scripture who are the prophets. And thank God the scripture clears it up. 
That's what the scripture always does. It throws light on whatever may be dark, whatever may be confusing, whatever we may not have understood, the scripture throws light on it. Let it uh, throw light in your mind right now. As we talk about who the prophet is, I'm going to run through a series of scriptures. And if you have had the erroneous idea of who a prophet is, like I had the erroneous idea in the past, you need to correct that with the understanding of scripture now. In Hosea chapter 12, reading from verse 13. And by a prophet the Lord brought out Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. How important that is. That's the description of a prophet. That's the ministry of the prophet. That's the life of the prophet. That is the message of the prophet. By a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. That's a prophet. You see as you look at Moses. You might uh, just be thinking about him as a lawgiver. You might be thinking about him as the one that appeared before Pharaoh. You might be thinking about him as the one that said, Let my people go. And that is true. And that is telling you that that is the composite ministry of the prophet. Taking the people of God from Egypt to the land of Canaan. And by a prophet was he preserved. The question I'm asking today is, is there anything we can refer to like Egypt? Is there anything we can refer to like the promised land? Are there people today that God is using and is taking people from Egypt, taking people from the world, and is bringing them into the kingdom of God? Are there people today that God is using and is preserving these people in the kingdom of God, getting ready to go to the land of promise, getting ready to go to heaven, Oh yes, there is. Who are they? Those are the messengers of God. Those are the servants of God. Those are the prophets of God. You see, the prophet is the one that comes to declare the mind of God, the will of God, the word of God. And the people are hearing that word and that will and that mind of God. And they are getting out of Egypt and they are moving on to the land of Canaan. It's not somebody that just stands somewhere ringing a bell or wearing a kind of gown. We are talking about the people that are the servants of the Lord. Well, that's not the only verse. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. So important uh, because uh, other people are going to ask you and you will need to teach other people. And if you are going to teach other people, you need to have an understanding of uh, who a prophet is. Look at it, Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Here is the description of the prophet. God said the, the prophet he knows about not the false prophets the prophet he knows about are the ones that he puts his word in their mouth. And then he says, I will command him what he shall speak. Who is a prophet then? The prophet is the one that has the word of God and he speaks that word so that the people will come to the Lord, they will be obedient to the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 30. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 30. Remember this Bible study? Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 30 it says, Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet they will not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hands of uh, the people of the land. You see, these were the people, they had read in the law of Moses, how we should obey the commandments of the Lord. And the blessings that will come to us is if we obey the commandments of the Lord, and the children of Israel were not obeying. And so these men of God, they came to them to warn them of judgment. They came to them to warn them of the consequence of disobedience. They came to them to tell them that, if, if they will repent, they came to them to tell them of the mercy of God. 
that God will seal up mercy upon them and they will come to the Lord and then they told them about the reward and the benefits of that repentance and obedience. What does the Bible call them? The Bible calls them prophets. Calls them prophets. And there are people like that today. You know there are some people that will accuse you and accuse our church and they will say, well, uh, there is teaching in your church but there is no prophet. What do you mean there is no prophet? Are there not people here bringing them out of Egypt to the Canaan land? Are there not people here that are preserving believers in the life of righteousness? That's the ministry of the prophet. Are there not people here that have the word of God in their mouth? And every time they open their mouth, you know them among our leaders, every time they open their mouth, they are declaring the truth and the word of God. The word that if we obey, we will get to heaven. Those are the prophets of God. Are, not, are they are not uh, prophets? Are they are not people here who are warning us? Who are telling us we have disobeyed? We have gone astray? Or we are backsliding? Or we have done things that are wrong? And they are calling us to come back unto the Lord. That's the voice of the prophet you are hearing in Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35 and in verse 15. I'm giving you these references so that the Bible will speak for itself. The Bible will speak for itself and then it will clear every doubt in your mind. Jeremiah chapter 35 verse 15. I have sent also unto you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way. And amend your doings, and go not after other gods who serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. You see the ministry of the prophet here. This is not a bell-ringing man. This is not a white garment-wearing man. This is not a person not having shoes in the, in the feet. We're not talking about that kind of prophet. We're talking about the real prophet. We're talking about the people that are calling others to repentance. We're talking about the people that God had seen. And they are proclaiming the word. And they are calling the people to repentance. They are saying, return ye now. Every man from his evil way amend your doings and go not after other gods to serve them. Well, those are the people the Bible gives us are the prophets in Daniel chapter 9 verse 10. Daniel chapter 9 verse 10. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, that's in verse 9, though we have rebelled against him, now verse 10, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which is set before us. Which is set before us. Who did he use to set the law before us? By his servants, the prophets. Uh, you see, many people feel that, well, if you're explaining the word of God, you're explaining the commandments of God, you are only a teacher. Oh, that's why they say that deeper life only has teachers, only has uh, perhaps pastor, but no prophet. But do you know that every one of those key ministries, they deal with the word of God. Can you have an apostle that doesn't preach the word? Can you have a prophet that doesn't teach the word? Can you have an evangelist that doesn't preach the word? Can you have a pastor that doesn't feed the people with the word of God? Can you have a teacher that does not explain and expound the word of God? What people do not realize is that whether apostle or evangelist or prophet or pastor or teacher, everyone is involved with the word. The raw material, if you please, the real thing that we use, the tools that we have in bringing about the transformation and the change and the ministry in the lives of men, women, and children is the Word of God. Don't tell me you are an apostle if you do not have the word and if you are not emphasizing the word. Don't tell me you are a prophet if you are not using the word of God, the reaching word of God to call people to repentance. Setting the commandment of God before the people. Setting the law of God before the people. Reminding them of the fact that Jesus is coming again. Taking the prophecies of the Bible 
and reassuring them that the Lord will definitely come and taking those prophecies of the Bible and telling them that it is when Christ comes he will reward all people according to his works because that's the ministry of the prophet taking the word of God making it plain setting it before the people you won't tell me you are a pastor if you are not feeding them with the word of God, if you are not feeding them with this manner that comes from heaven, and can you be a teacher? Can you be a teacher without the word? Giving it to them, explaining it to them, expanding it to them, so that the people will be a firm in the word of God in Zechariah chapter 1 and in verse 4. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 4. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But he did not hear, nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. It still tells us that the ministry of the prophet here is just to bring the people to the real world of God in Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day and the dreadful day of the Lord. What will that prophet do when he comes? He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. That is it. He will teach them the word of God that will remove conflict. That will remove the uh, commotion and division. That will bring unity and love and fellowship. He that prophet will turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In Luke chapter 1 verse 7 to 6. And verse 7 to 7. Luke chapter 1 verse 7 to 6. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest. Remember this is talking about John the Baptist. And then it says, Thou shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. To give knowledge of salvation. Stop there for a moment, my brothers and sisters. This is the revelation of God. This is the thing that opens our eyes to the ministry of the prophet. And some people, they have a wrong notion of who the prophet is. Here it says, you'll be called the prophet of the highest. What will be the ministry? What will be the thing that this prophet will be doing? To give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. You know, if you are going to think of John, uh, John the Baptist, he wasn't uh, giving prophecy about when it will rain, when it will be sunshine. He wasn't giving prophecy about drought. He wasn't giving prophecy about famine. He wasn't giving prophecy about, you know, uh, who you will marry, who you will not marry, about all these things. But he gave the word of God. And he told the people to repent for the kingdom of God is Satan. That part of the word, the kingdom of God is Satan, that's prophetic. And also when he was saying the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit shall be hewn down. Uh, again, remember what I said before. When you mention tree, whether in historical narrative or you are mentioning it in prophecy or in parable, the interpretation will depend on the mode of writing, the mode of communication. Now this is prophetic. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is hewn down. It's talking about human beings. And you see that is prophetic. It's saying that in the future, at the time of judgment, the trees will be cut down if they have not brought forth good fruit. He gave the knowledge of salvation. Behold the lamp of God that takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist came and, uh, you know, the Bible refers to him as the prophet of the highest. He will give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sin. I, I am pleading with you that you should come to the knowledge of Scripture and you should understand who a real prophet is according to the word of God so that we will not be carrying erroneous ideas about of who a prophet is. Uh, some people will say, hey, those Old Testament people you have referred to now that you know they were prophets and they did this, they centered on the word of God. 
How about in the New Testament? When it says he gives some apostles and prophets and evangelists and prophets and uh, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the defining of the body of Christ. In the New Testament, who can we refer to as a prophet? Very simple, Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and in verse 32. Acts chapter 15 and in verse 32. Look at what it says. And Judas and Silas being prophets. Wait there a moment. Judas, not Judas Iscariot. And Silas. Well, you may not know much of Judas, but you know a little about Silas. Silas says the companion was the companion of Paul. After Barnabas had dropped off. And you see uh, Paul and Silas went about. What did they do? Uh, were they talking about it will rain, it will not rain? Were they talking about you, you marry you, you did not marry? Were they talking about famine, about drought? Were they talking about, you know, all these things that the white government people are talking about? Well, you know that they were preaching the word. And it calls them prophets. Si uh, Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves. What was their ministry? They exalted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They exalted the brethren with many words and they confirmed them. Now you can see that very clearly the ministry of the prophets in the New Testament is that you are exalting. You are exhorting and you are preaching to the people. You are explaining to the people and you are making the faith of the believers to stand very firm as a result of the ministry of the prophet. I needed to take time on that because there are many people that have got confused on that area. And they have been thinking, well, if I become a prophet, I'll be shaking, I'll be pushing people, they'll be falling on the ground, they'll be foaming in the mouth, they'll be uh, having uh, almost like they have epileptic feet. No, that's not what you find in the New Testament. The prophet is the one that speaks to men on behalf of the Lord. Now, in all these things that we have studied, come back to Hebrews now, chapter 1 and verse 1. In that thing that we have studied in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, we have seen very clearly that the Holy Spirit establishes the divine authority and the divine authorship of the Old Testament. It also establishes its accuracy and its authority through the fact that it was given to and delivered by God's prophet. We can summarize this way, that the scripture was fully inspired by God. Now Hebrews chapter 1, now verse 2. I am going to start from verse 1 and jump some things and come to verse 2 for your understanding. God, as in these last days, spoken unto us by his Son. Actually, you know that what that is what he's saying. Because if you just start from verse 2, as in these last days, you then want to know what is the antecedent. That is, what precedes that, that now you can join with us in these last days. Spoken unto us by his son. Who is the one speaking? You have to go back to verse 1. God, who spoke in the past by a particular method and in various ways, that same God as in these last days, spoken unto us by his son. This brings me to the uh, second point, the complete and final revelation through Christ. This one tells us that these last days, the one at the center stage, is no more the prophets of the Old Testament, it's not even the prophets of any, any dispensation, the one at the center stage now is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's why we don't run after any man. We don't run after any prophet. Even though we knew men in the past, we know no man now, but Jesus Christ. It brings you to the event of the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Moses, they saw Elijah, and then they saw the cloud. And then a voice came and said, This is my only begotten son, hear ye him. The moment they looked up like this, they found that Moses had gone, Elijah had gone. The one that occupied the center stage, the centrality of the revelation of God, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
It's not the one that we worship. It's not the one that we adore. It's not the one that we listen to. It's now our Savior, our Lord, our Teacher, our Redeemer. It's the all in all for us. It's now Christ, the Son of God, that occupies that center stage. Is that an afterthought? Or did we have that already prophesied in the Old Testament? Oh yes, from the Old Testament. We're going back to Deuteronomy again. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from among the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Moses said, listen, a time will come that another one, a prophet with a capital P, a prophet higher and greater, a, a prophet that has a major ministry and a final ministry, more than all the other prophets, will the Lord give unto you like unto me. And unto him will you hearken. In verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Actually, this is referring to Christ. There may be, I know some people in another religion that will tell you that you see even your Bible says, A prophet shall come, and I will put my word in his mouth. And then you, you say, yes, the Bible says that. They say, do you know who that prophet is? Then they will refer to a particular individual who is the head and the founder of their religion. They will say, that is a prophet that is being spoken of. But is that the truth? No, it's not the truth. See the interpretation of that in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 from verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. That's talking about the same prophecy we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And it says in verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Still talking about the same thing, he follows on by saying, It wasn't only Moses that spoke about him, others spoke about him to ye. And all the prophets from Samuel, and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Then it says in the application, Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now he wants to tell us the name of that prophet. The name of the one to come. The name of the one that God said, I'll raise up a prophet from among you. And I will put my word in his mouth. In verse 26, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus. That's that prophet. That's the one to come. That's the one that now has that word. And you remember God now as in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. What's a blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, here we have the, the Mount of Transfiguration experience. And uh, let me read from verse 1. And uh, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them, bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, if you will permit, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Stop there for a moment. Uh, Peter was not realizing that the time had come when Jesus will not be at the center stage. 
that will not be Moses representing the law, uh, Elijah representing the prophets, and then Jesus making three tabernacles so that they will each have a tabernacle. And they will be looked up uh, to you or at the same level. But now see what happened in verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, the voice out of the clouds which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Not a combination of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. The prophets have now gone aside. He has now spoken unto us by his Son. Look at verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. Jesus is now at the center stage. He is the one that is speaking to us. The Father is no more using, uh, was no more using the other channels and speaking unto man. He is now speaking unto us by His Son. In John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself. You remember? A prophet will I give you. He will not speak of himself. I will put my word in his mouth, and unto him you will hearken. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. In chapter 17 of John, verse 8. John chapter 17, verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou givest me. You see that? The word you have from Christ is the word of the Father. The word which thou givest me. The word which thou givest me. It is important for us to realize that although in the past, that is in the past dispensations, in the past generations, the Almighty God spoke uh, to the fathers by the prophets. But now in this time, He is speaking unto us by His Son. Now, how everlasting, how eternal, how solid is that word? Uh, Mark chapter 13 tells us, Mark chapter 13 verse 31. In Mark chapter 13 verse 31, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Uh, do you realize the significance of what he's saying there? He's telling you that uh, there were some things that Moses said that has passed away. The ceremonial laws, the ceremonies and the rituals and the sacrifices and the tabernacle worship and all those things, all those things have passed away. Those are things of the past. In fact, the words of the earlier prophets, there were some of the things they said concerning Babylon, concerning Greece, concerning Rome. All those things have been fulfilled, and even those uh, nations and empires have been forgotten. But Jesus said, here is the last word. Here is the final word. Here is the final dispensation. You may see that all those things are passing, but the words I speak unto you is a final thing. is a final revelation. This one shall never pass away. And do you know that when Jesus spoke, the people that listened to him, what was their comment? At different times, you know what they said? They said, he spoke with authority and not as the scribes, not as the Pharisees. In fact, when they were sent to catch him in John chapter 7 and in verse 46, here is the testimony of those who had him first, uh, first hand. It is said in John chapter 7 verse 46, the officers answered, never man spake like this man. They said, there is no comparison between Moses and this man. There is no comparison between David and this man. There is no comparison between Jeremiah and this man, Daniel and this man, and Isaiah and this man, and uh, Moses and this man, Jonah and this man. They said there is no comparison. Never man spake like this man. The final voice, the final message had come. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, 
spake unto our fathers by the prophets. He now at this time, he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. That tells us that God's full complete revelation awaited the coming of Christ, the son of God. The Old Testament, yes, is fully inspired by God. But it was not the complete revelation without the New Testament. Understand what I mean? One chapter of the, any chapter of the Bible you pick is inspired by God. But one chapter is not the complete revelation. One chapter is not the complete truth. It is completely the truth of God, but it's not the complete truth. Every word, every statement, every chapter is inspired as God's revelation. But a chapter does not make the whole revelation. A book, a part of the revelation, is not, the, is not complete without the rest. Every part of God's revelation is free from error, yes, but the Old Testament as God's revelation remained incomplete until the New Testament was finished. In these last days, therefore, that is in this last dispensation, the period of God's last method of communication, he now communicates his word, his will to man by his son. Jesus Christ as an authority superior to all those who have spoken in times past. And there will be peculiar guilt in refusing to attend to what Jesus has spoken. Why? Well, a number of reasons. Because he has superior authority. Because of his rank. Because of his dignity. Because he's equal with God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Because he's God. That's why that, that, that authority is supreme. And himself, he had God Almighty even called Jesus God. Oh, you say anything like that in the Bible? Well, you, you must have heard that, uh, you know, the other time in our service. Yesterday in the service. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 again. It says, but unto the Son he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. There the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is called God. And Jesus has a right, therefore, to command. And when he speaks, men must obey. Another reason for his greater authority is the clearness of the truth, which he communicated to man on many subjects that are of the highest significance to the world. Among such subjects are the character of God, who has shown us the revelation, the character of God, more than Jesus Christ. Also, the way in which man may be reconciled to God. He has also given us the clearest view which man has ever had of the future state. The people that came before the Lord Jesus Christ, they spoke about the future state, but things were not as clear. But Jesus Christ came and he cleared up everything concerning heaven, concerning hell, concerning the future state. He revealed the doctrine of the resurrection of the body. Christ revealed a heaven and he also told us of a hell. He showed us how we might gain heaven and how we might avoid hell. He spoke without any doubt, without ambiguity when he spoke about God, when he spoke about heaven, when he spoke about hell. His language was a language of one who, was fami who is familiar with all that he describes. He had seen it all, he had known it all. As we have learned about all these things, uh, how do we conclude the study of today? I bring the study of today to, the, to conclusion by reading to you from Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. It's telling us that the final revelation has come. Christ is the one that has spoken in these last days. That's the last dispensation. There is no dispensation after Christ. And after Christ has spoken the final word. He has given us the final revelation. There is nobody that can now come and say, Well, you know, Jesus didn't tell you everything. Jesus didn't reveal everything. There is still another doctrine. 
not revealed by the prophets of the previous generation and even by Christ. And I am the special messenger that comes to reveal to you that new doctrine. He said, if anybody comes with another gospel, let him be accursed. He's telling us the revelation is not complete. It is not final. And if any man shall add unto what has been revealed, God will add the plagues, the pains, and the problems, and the wrath, and the indignation that are reaching the judgment of God reaching this book will add unto him. In verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and out of the things which are written in this book. We have had a lot today, but the question is, what am I going to do with what I have heard? All that you have heard has only made you to become responsible to do something with it. Let me close by telling you that uh, what has happened now is uh, just the smallest part of your uh, activity, of your action or reaction to the word of God. You have only heard. You have only heard. And as you have heard, there is something that ought to follow. You ought to endeavor to understand. Meditate on it. Uh, you see, you understand. You also meditate. And you apply this word to your very life. And a final thing, you obey. I've given you five things. Number one, which you have done as you have heard. Number two, you endeavor to understand. Number three, you meditate. Uh, you, uh, you pour over it, you think over it, and you look at the verses again on all the things we have shared together, and then you apply it to your life, and then you obey, because it is not the hearers of the word that are justified, but the doers of the word. Be ye not hearers, therefore, but the doers of the word. And also make up your mind that you are coming next week, because God is now revealing to us great things from this epistle to the Hebrews, and it's going to be a wonderful series. We have just introduced it today. And next week, I'm talking to you on the sevenfold ministry and characteristic and revelation about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's a study you will not like to miss. I want you to rise up right now and uh, talk to the Lord in prayer that these things the Lord has revealed unto you, you are going to let it sink in and you are going to act on the word of God. And you are going to search more. You are going to read more. You are going to try to find out from the word of God more. Comparing scripture with scripture. That this scripture may transform your life. Transform your understanding. Make you equipped. Ready to serve the Lord more. As we are being taught of the word of God. Pray very well. And let there be definite transformation in your life. Before you go home today.